Thank you, everyone. Okay, you comfortable? Does everyone have a Bible? Okay. <laughs> so we're having a Holy Spirit Bible study tonight. Okay, so it's a Bible study with lots of Holy Spirit fire. Amen? That's what we want. <laughs> On Sunday, we looked at a, a subject which was a, a great subject of the conquest of Canaan, the children of Israel taking the land that God had promised them. And God had said to them, go and fill that land, all of it. And God was not satisfied with them filling part of it. He was not satisfied with anything half-hearted. His will was that they would take that whole land according to his purpose. And uh, eventually they did, with a few hiccups along the way. And we looked at how they got a little bit lethargical and down tools before they'd finished. But they did finish, and that was wonderful. And we looked at a particular character called Caleb, uh, who we're going to be looking at this evening. And uh, Caleb had a different spirit to a lot of the children of Israel. A lot of them, it's probably fair to say, didn't really have a great, uh, deep experience of God. They saw the fire come down. They were in the right places. But did they personally know God individually? And uh, it would seem that a lot of them, they were very young in their knowledge of God. And uh, so we need people who've got that maturity of relationship with God to kind of be a, a signpost for us. And Joshua was this wonderful military leader who took the children of Israel into the promised land. But this Caleb character was also with him. And uh, he is just an incredible example of God's grace. So we're going to look at him today. This man who, at the age of 85 years old, had the same strength that he had when he was 40. He had the same faith, the same vigor, the same appetite for life, the same trust in God's promises. In 40 years of wandering around the wilderness with a bunch of complainers who didn't believe anything, it didn't dampen his spirits. Isn't that terrific? As Christians, your spirit can get dampened sometimes. You keep company with certain people. You think... I need, a, I need a bit of time out. But he came out of that wilderness running, which is a tremendous, incredible thing. And it tells us that we can come out of the most difficult, long, drawn-out times of our life running if we have been developing a deeper relationship with God. And Caleb did. And Caleb is a wonderful name. My son's called Caleb, my second boy. And that name we chose because it means a wholehearted or faithful or of the heart. I think I mentioned this on Sunday. Lev is the Hebrew word for heart. And so he was definitely a man of the heart, and God had said to him, my servant Caleb has done everything I said uh, to him to do wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, not faint-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. And that is how we have to live our Christian lives, isn't it? Wholeheartedly. Even when we get knocked left and right, and even when we have these challenges, and we're going to look at some challenges this evening, we're going to look at some battle, but he approached it with a different spirit and a whole heart, and that is really what just makes him stand out, and uh, God himself says these words of Caleb. He says, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. And what's wonderful is Caleb's faith meant there was an inheritance not just for him, but for his children and his children's children. And when we inherit in God, you know, through Christ Jesus, it is not just for us, it's for all those who will follow our, our physical children as they come to faith in the Lord, but also our spiritual children as well. And God is so fond of Caleb. You get this sense uh, from God, that he has a fondness for this man with a different spirit. Caleb's father, his name was Jephuna, and he was a Kenizzite. So he, his father wasn't even an Israelite. He married Caleb's mother, and Caleb was born. And Jephuna means to, to turn to face. And you can imagine this man who was a Kenizzite, an inhabitant of Canaan, turning to face God and, and, draw, and being drawn into the nation of Israel. Uh, and his whole attitude 
has gone from wherever it was facing to now facing God. And isn't that really how it works for all of us in life? That every day is a matter of turning to face God. You know, if you're not a Christian, one day you've got to turn and face God and, and let his love invade your life and, and let him just uh, pour himself over you and receive forgiveness of your sins. But for us Christians, every day we have to decide to face God, like Jephunneh did, and to let his face shine upon us. Like Jephunneh, once we were outside God's kingdom, but today we are not, we're inside. Isn't that a point of rejoicing? You know, life is tough, but when I take a deep breath, I think, Lord, at least I'm in your kingdom. I'm your child. Whatever happens, no one can take that away. Amen? No one can take that from any of us today because Jesus has secured it on the cross through his sacrifice for us. Hallelujah. So if you have received the Lord Jesus today, you're not alone in your struggle. You are not alone in your challenges. You're now part of the family He's brought you into the family of God. And you no longer suffer alone. And the Apostle Paul writes this, that when one suffers, we all suffer. We suffer together and we support one another. So, Caleb. Should we have a look at Caleb a bit more? We're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 13, if you have your Bibles. But uh, Caleb was born... Uh, into, into Israel, and he was placed, if you like, in the, the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah, a good place to be put. His mother would have been there, and uh, he was brought inside. And, it's, and when you were uh, not an Israelite by nature, but you were brought into Israel, you were still treated with all the rights of an Israelite. And that's so important, you know, when the stranger comes into Israel and says, I want your God to be my God and your people my people, you are now Israel. And that's how it was. Um, And so there were no secondary kind of considerations. And we see this with Rahab. And we see this with Ruth, (laughs) Moabites and Canaanites, who said, I see your God is God. I'm turning my face to him. I want to be part of the house of Israel. And they took their place. And not only were they accepted, but they, Ruth was in the genealogy of our Lord, wasn't she? This is how, God, how good God is. And so there is a call here to anyone who is outside the kingdom of God uh, to come and take your place in the kingdom of God. Come and take your place in the family of God. It is waiting for you. It is vacant with your name on it. No one else can sit down in the seat that God has prepared for you. You need to come and accept your place like Jephunneh did in the the people of God. So Caleb was one of the spies that was sent to spy out the land of Canaan before they tried to conquer it. And uh, we read this in Numbers 13. And we've got the uh, words up on the slides. So let's read. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many, what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Sin as far as Rehob towards Libo Hamath. And they went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And when they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. And that place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelite cut off there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole community, the Israelite community at Kadesh 
in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people there uh, we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We'll explain that in a moment. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. And that's the account. And that's also found in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 19 to 36, has a different account. Interesting, isn't it, that they said that that's how we looked in our own eyes, and that's how we looked to them, as though they could possibly know how they looked to them. All they could tell was how they looked through their own eyes. And as you will have found in the story of Jericho, it was quite the opposite way around, because they were terrified, it turns out, of the Israelites. But they didn't know this. They just judged it with their natural eye. You can't trust your natural eye, can you, to determine whether or not you could have victory in a situation. You have to have the spiritual eyes. And these giants in the land were terrifying to their sight. And it put them off. Even though God had said, take the land, be courageous, I'm giving you the land, I am with you. Even though God had said all those things, when they looked with their natural eye, they turned away from it. They'd done it 40 years early. They did it 40 years, and it, it took 40 years for them to come back to it. Wandering in the desert, one year for every day that they spied out the land. But how does this then end? Joshua chapter 14, just another brief reading. Let's have a look at this. So we can see already that, jo that uh, Caleb has a very different spirit. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me had made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. On that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which you set your feet and where they have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. And I'm still as strong today as the day when Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. And it says, Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Wow. So Caleb believed it from the moment he got there. He saw the fruit of the land, and he saw the giants, and he chose to focus on the fruit. 
The other spies, they saw the fruit of the land and they saw the giants and they chose to focus on the giants. So there's a question for all of us in life is where are we going to focus on? We're we going to focus on what God is giving us, the goodness of the land of the, the, of the Lord, or are we going to focus on all the obstacles in between? And it's easy to get distracted, especially when something looks scary. But this is the decision that Caleb made. Caleb's faith did uh, sort of three things, really, that I put down here. It enabled him to look on the land and see the promises of God fulfilled. And with Caleb, everything is about the promises of God. If God has promised it, then I want it, because God does not lie. If it's about the promise of God, Caleb's all over it. God has promised, God has promised. And that is how he lived his life. In Numbers 23, verse 19, it says, God is not human that he should lie, nor a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? That's a question that doesn't need answering. God always answers his promises. And in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. What that verse means is that God, the, the promises of God are always yes. And our response is amen. See how that works. God promises, we say amen, because we know our God is truthful and never lies. And Caleb took God at his word, took it at face value. It's a promise from God. I'm going to live on that promise. That's the first thing he did. The second thing that he did, I think we've talked about already, was that he saw the fruit of the land and not the problem. And, you know, one of the things I was reflecting on, when we pray, do we describe the problem to God or do we just declare his faithfulness in our prayers? Because God doesn't really need us to describe the problem to him. You know, I mean, if we think it helps, then fine. But actually, it's quite a waste of time, you know, explaining the problem. Oh, God, this and then this and, you know. And we can do that. And we're not, we should pour out our hearts naturally before God. But we don't need to describe the problem. Our focus is on the Lord himself. The one who is going, we know is going to bring us through our problem. We get distracted very easily by the detail of the problem. The lamb was good, just as said, God said it would be. Third thing that Caleb did was he silenced the doubters. And this is so important, isn't it? I'm going to test you on those three things in a minute. Okay. He silenced the doubters. He said, we can do it. We can do it. Why? Because God has said you will do it. He's not just being positive. He's not just being a positive person. God has said that you're going to do it. And so he's saying, we're going to do it. We can do it. Let's not entertain conversations, friends. Even in our own heads, where unbelief starts to set in. And we start to change it. And it changes from, is God going to do it? Can we do it? Question mark. We put the question mark on the end, don't we? We can do it in Christ. So Caleb wanted Hebron, this place in Israel. And I've called it here the home of the promise. And you might say, well, why did Caleb want Hebron? And I think there's a slide that will come up on the screen. But basically, it's where Abraham pitched his tent after God promised him the land. Very significant place. God said, go and walk in the land. I'm going to give it to you. And so Caleb did, and he set his tent down in Hebron. Hebron is where he, he um, bought the field and buried his wife. Hebron is where Abraham was buried. Hebron is where Isaac, his son, and his wife were buried. Hebron is where his, his grandson, Jacob, was buried. And he was even brought back from Egypt, mummified, <laughs> and buried in Hebron. Do you see how Hebron had become this place? They owned this field in Hebron. It's the only bit of the land they owned but it was theirs. And so they were all buried there, and it was the place from which they looked out and saw everything else that God was going to give them. If we don't camp out at what God has already given us and survey what, what is yet to come, we will lose the vision of what is to come. That's where they camped out, so they could see the land that God was giving them. And I think Caleb appreciated the heritage and the spiritual significance of Hebron. 
But what about these giants? There were giants in the land. You know, when we try to do things in life, there's often giants that get in our way, day to day. And uh, they, they're, they're awful, aren't they? And they, sometimes we think, how can I defeat these giants? But uh, we read, and uh, I'm not quite sure where it is, but the words, from Hebron, Caleb drove out the Anakites, and he mentions their three names. And many years ago, one of our pastors preached on this for quite a while, the three giants of Anak uh, that Caleb defeated. And their names were Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. And uh, there's no detail about how he defeated them. It just says, Caleb went in and kicked them out. It was just like that. And yet these were huge giants, monstrous people. And you think surely that there was more to it than that. No. He knew he, that he was going to defeat them, and he did. And that was as simple as that. They were no match for Caleb because he had faith and because he had a different spirit. And, I, you know, that's one thing I, I think we have to take into account is don't underestimate the power of our faith. Don't underestimate the power of your faith. Don't underestimate the fact that you have the Holy Spirit of God. Because so many in the world do not have the Spirit of God working on them and in them. So that makes us quite amazing, doesn't it? And what God can do on us is tremendous. These Anakim were a race of giants. And they were considered, in uh, Numbers 13, to be Nephilim. And we did read this earlier. And you might be thinking, Matt, who are all these different types of people? The Nephilim in Genesis 6, it says uh, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. And uh, that's very early on, pre-flood. And uh, there's two schools of thought here with regards to who these sons of God are. One is that they're the, the sons of Seth, who married the daughters of Cain. But the more commonly believed and held view is that it's fallen angels who have slept with women. So those are the two views, and there doesn't seem to be a consensus. I think it would be fair to say for a fallen angel to sleep with a woman, uh, it would be physically not something that they could do, because we know that in Matthew it says that the angels themselves in heaven don't get married. They don't have those sorts of relationships. So if it were an angel, it would have to be through a demonic possession of a man. It's the only way that that could be done. Why am I giving you this detail? Well, this is the Nephilim. This is who we're talking about. If someone says to you, who are the Nephilim? This is who they are. They are these giant people who lived before the flood, are commonly believed to be the product of the, the demonic angels sleeping somehow with the daughters of men. But... Uh, what we have to bear in mind is that this giant race would have been destroyed completely in the flood. Because we read very clearly in Genesis 7, every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, all mankind. Everything on dry land that had breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped out. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. So when we read of the, the Nephilim, they were wiped out in the flood. So why are these guys being called Nephilim, these Anakites? Are they also born of demonic angels? Or, well, we don't really know. But what I do know is this, is that the word Nephilim uh, also means giant or bully. So they may well have earned their reputation through association with that kind of behavior. The sheer size of these guys and their bullying behavior terrified the people around them. And that is why they were called Nephilim. And yet this did not put Caleb off. So let's have a look at these three giants very briefly. Ahiman, I think we have a slide. And the definition means brother of or brother of a gift or brother of whom. And the Talmud puts it like this, that it's whose brother will fight with me. Now, who does that remind you of? Another giant. Goliath, yeah? Come on, send me a man to fight with, is exactly the words that Goliath said. 
And here we have Ahiman, who seems to have, this certainly in terms of the meaning of his name, we have no um, reference to anything he did, only his name. But in some ways, the name paints a picture. This boastful, threatening giant who stands and shouts and threatens and says, come on then, fight me, and puts heart, fear into people's hearts through his words and boastings and intimidation. This is the type of giant we're talking about. He would intimidate. How many of us have experienced that in our lives? At certain times, we, hit, we suddenly get intimidation coming at us, boastfulness, arrogance, threats, verbal assault, and that is a way that the devil will come at us sometimes, isn't it? It's a demonic attack that comes on people, particularly the people of God. That is the kind of giant this is that Caleb defeated, this verbal abusive, verbally abusive giant. And one can imagine the people cowering under the words that were coming out of his mouth, too intimidated to go near him or challenge him or do anything or to stop him. And yet, as we said, Goliath was very, very similar. And what was David's response to Goliath? You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin and all that talk. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. See, David knew he came in the name of the Lord. What do we do? when we're intimidated by this kind of oppression and verbal abuse, we come in the name of the Lord and we say that you shall not conquer me. You sh your, your abuse and your verbal uh, boasting shall not touch me in Jesus' name. The name of Jesus we raise over that kind of abuse. And if you are suffering that and if you have had that in your work situation or in your family or wherever, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ because then you can declare his name over your situation and silence this giant that would try to bully and intimidate you. What about the next giant, Sheshai? And the, the root meaning of this it has a number of possible meanings. So what I will say with this is that we don't know exactly, not 100%. But for me, I get a very visual image of what these giants are like. So the name Sheshay can mean noble or marble or flax. Uh, flax is a, is a type of plant that grows um, and it was used for covering your roof and stuff and it was white in color. Six, mercy or whitish. So there you go, there's some possible meanings. And the Talmud, they say that the, the second stood there as, as solid as a block of marble. So they've gone for marble in the Talmud. And there were two things that occurred to me with this giant. And uh, actually, I've just remembered that I had it on my phone. So yes, yeah, so in terms of the definition, something bleached white, linen, fine linen, or alabaster, similar stone, marble. It's all white, isn't it? Whether it's flax or whether it's marble, it's white. And there's two elements that stood out to me. And also the number six, which we know is the number of man, the number of perfection as far as man is concerned. And one is this, that it is immovable like marble. Marble is so heavy. I remember my dad started a marble importing company once from the Philippines. So he went there on holiday, came back, and had started a company for some reason. Most people go and sit on a beach. And I remember the tables arriving that he had ordered and the weight of them. They are so heavy and hard to move. And you can imagine this huge cut piece of white marble, immovable. You cannot shift it. And there's a sense of hopelessness that that gives you. This thing is never going to move. This thing is never going to go. I'm never going to be able to move this thing out of my life. And I wonder whether this kind of giant uh, has a spirit of hopelessness which it puts on people. Another aspect of this, that uh, this is all possibilities, but travel with me if you will, is the sheer presentation of it being so white that this is almost like this giant is giving a standard of perfection which no one can achieve. That he's whiter than white in that sense. 
that the number six is the number of man, that somehow this giant is saying, you will never be good enough. You will never achieve the level of perfection that I have. Now, I don't know this for sure at all, but we can imagine the sheer size and weight of this thing, the, the, the way that it tries to embed hopelessness in a person that tries to come across it. And maybe some of us feel helpless sometimes, or hopeless. Maybe our hopelessness comes from a situation which just hasn't changed and we need it to change. Maybe our hopelessness comes from the fact that we are perfectionists and we don't feel we can achieve perfection and so we feel hopeless and stagnated. I wonder whether this giant is, is in your life, that there is a root of hopelessness where you just cannot see your way through and somehow you've lost hope that the Lord is going to bring you through. What about our third giant? Oh, I should have mentioned in that one. Um, what do we do when we feel hopeless? We just remember the word of God, don't we? Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I can imagine Caleb running towards these giants with just those sorts of words, not that they'd been written at this time, but the spirit of those words were in his footsteps. The Lord is renewing my strength. He's soaring on wings like eagles. And every step that he runs, he gets faster, not slower. And every step he runs, he, he feels more energized and more certain of the outcome. And that's the thing when we run with God, is the more we run, the more we realize that we are on the threshold of victory. We don't grow tired when we run in God. We get stronger and more energized. And this is the promise of God. We soar like eagles. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. But we have to hold unswervingly to that hope. Our job is the holding. Our job is not swerving, not deviating, holding it as close to you. If it's the only thing we can hold on to for dear life, our arms are wrapped around this hope. But the third giant, Talmai, definition is the plowman or furrowed. One, and this is the Talmud, one who makes plow lines in the soil when he moves. Very visual. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a giant with such strength and force that he makes you want to get out of the way. He churns up the ground as he approaches with speed and ferocity, and we think, if I don't get out of the way, it's going to mow me down. And, it's, and I, I see this as a giant that makes us ha tries to make us move and give ground. And the natural inclination is to get out of the way. But God says, hold your ground. When the terror comes at you and you think this is going to destroy me, you hold your ground in faith because the Lord is with you. It's a, fear it's a fear tactic, a frontal attack coming straight at us, threatening us. Maybe we fear our, our, our lives physically. Maybe we, the fear is our job, our reputation, our family. And this thing comes at us. And I think, if I don't get out of the way, this is going to destroy those things. And yet God says, you stay where you are. And we see this played out in public, don't we? With certain issues in this modern age, with the spirit of the age that doesn't want to know the word of God. And the Christian speaks the word of God. And then the ferocity of the enemy comes against them. And, and, they have, and the Christian has to make a decision. Do I get out of the way now and go back undercover? Or do I stay here and risk everything? And we see people doing it. We've seen it with bakers in Ireland. We've seen it with a doctor at the moment who was struck off because he didn't support certain modern mindsets and viewpoints. He stood his ground. It would be so easy to say, do you know what, it's not worth my job. It's not worth this. But he said, no, it is worth it. I'm standing my ground and if my job goes, then it goes. If my life goes, then it goes. And actually, what do we have to fear? What can we hold on to anyway, friends? 
only the Lord, amen? So, the three giants that Caleb defeated. I find them very interesting. I, I see them at work in our age. I, don't, I wonder if you do. I wonder if you see that boastful, intimidating spirit at work in our society, maybe even in your life. I wonder if you see that impossible to attain, immovable uh, object of hopelessness that robs you of joy because it's robbed you of hope. And I wonder if you have experienced that sheer fear that this thing is going to destroy me and ruin me. But the Christian is not to fear ruin because the Lord upholds us. Amen. And Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. Those three giants stood no chance with Caleb because he knew these words were true. And that, that's what made him act. Hallelujah. So I've said, you know, we can't be 100% sure about these giants and their names. That's the best that I can do, but I think it's very, very interesting. But that's what, what can we take away from this? When we experience these giants in our lives that want to take us down, hold on to God's promises, bed down where God promised it, camp out there and look out over the land from there, keeping your goal in view. Use the name of the Lord against that boasting, arrogant spirit, because the name of the Lord is our strong tower, amen? Be courageous. Stand your ground, for the Lord stands with you. And remember, finally, that we have a different spirit. We have the Holy Spirit, who is the indomitable spirit, which cannot be overcome. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you today that the battle is yours. We thank you for your promises, which are yes and amen. We say amen to your promises. Lord, we thank you that you do not lie. You are faithful in all you do. And Lord, no matter what we experience in life, what giants come against us, in, in the name of Jesus, we will stand. And then in the name of Jesus, not only will we stand, but we will be courageous and victorious. And we will evict these giants. So Lord, we just pray, hallelujah, we lift up the name of Jesus, our Lord. We thank you that in our day, in, our, in this age, in our lives, the Spirit of God is powerful, powerful as it ever has been, that, Lord, your promises stand as firmly as they have ever stood. And we stand on those promises today, as Caleb did in that day. And, Lord, we pray your will be done. We pray, Holy Spirit, fill us afresh, we pray. Change us, mold us, make us. Uh, Lord, we want to see the name of Jesus lifted high. We don't want to live lives, Lord, that are comfortable for us. Lord, we've done that. We want to live now for you. We want to live in the fullness of your promise and the power of your spirit. So I pray for anyone today who needs uh, just a refreshing from you, having done uh, battle with these giants, maybe one or more. Lord, would you refresh them with your Holy Spirit today? We just speak the name of Jesus over their lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have called them to do great exploits, that, Lord, they are your warriors. You have sent them, and they come, Lord, from you with your spirit. What can the enemy do to us? Oh, Lord, may we pray that your church, we will be close to you, that we will be perfect in you. Oh, mighty God, and in this day, Lord, may we have that spirit that Caleb had, and may we act, Lord, and for your glory, that Jesus be glorified in us. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Bless you.